I think we should start because Sam has to teach at noon. <laughs> so I'm going to be out of here in Flash at 11.45. No offense. Alright, so I'm going to talk about the Hippocamp for information map. Here's a big question. Um, the main question I want to answer is what sort of cognitive map do we have in our heads? Of course, this is a question a lot of you are interested in. Um, and there's a sort of conventional wisdom that is implicit or explicit in a lot of the talks that we've already seen that a map tells you where you are. Um, I'm going to talk about a different sort of idea where um, the, the idea of a predictive map that's telling you where you will be. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how much this I'm going to get to, certainly not all of it. Um, so I'm going to talk about first about the origins of the cognitive map idea, um, and then I'm going to talk about the notion of a cognitive map from a reinforced learning perspective and introduce uh, a, a particular formal instantiation of a predictive map known as the successor representation. And I'm going to use that to reinterpret um, play cells and grid cells at, at, a, at a fairly high level of abstraction. Right? So I'm not going to grapple with some of the more detailed biophysical issues that some of the other talks have talk, uh, discussed. Um, and if I have time, I might tell you about some of the experimental evidence that we've collected. Right, and, I, and I will skip through a few parts of this that I think have been well covered by the other talks. All right, so as everyone knows, the idea of a cognitive map goes back to uh, Tolman, and he did these very creative experiments, um, such as the following, where you, you, you put a rat in, a, in uh, a maze like this, it'd have to follow some convoluted path to food, and then you could put it back into um, the same starting point, but now uh, replace this convoluted path with this radial-arm maze, and Amazingly, the rat knows uh, to go along the shortest Euclidean path to the food source. Um, and the importance of the, these kinds of experiments um, lay in the fact that it, was, it seemed basically impossible to account for these kinds of behaviors in terms of the prevailing behaviorist ideology of Tolman's day, uh, the idea that you had to be reinforced to uh, produce a particular behavior. Here, the animals never followed this path, never got reinforced for this path, and yet it knows to follow it. Um, and he did other experiments, for example, uh, the idea of latent learning, where you could let an animal explore a box without explicitly re reinforcing it, and then at some point, you'll start reinforcing it, and the animals that got this pre-exposure phase um, see, uh, would do better um, than animals that didn't have that pre-exposure phase. Um, so it stood to reason that even though the animals weren't getting explicitly reinforced during the pre-exposure phase, they were doing some form of learning that was not reinforcement-driven, and that's uh, what Tolman coined latent learning. So, so what is the cognitive map? So Tolman had all these very suggestive experiments, but he was not very precise about what exactly he meant by cognitive map. Um, and that was left to later authors to elaborate. So O'Keefe and Adele in their famous book discuss this, um, and um, also a, a canonical reference is Gallistel's book. Um, and so a, a kind of abstract definition of a cognitive map is something like the following, a set of landmarks in Euclidean uh, spatial metric encoding distances between landmarks. Um, so how is this map constructed? What is it good for? Um, all right, so we've already talked about path integration, so I'm going to basically skip this part. Um, but but the, the point here is that um, an animal can use, uh, uh, can accumulate information about its vectors to figure out its location and plan shortest paths home, and this is kind of like the canonical use case of a cognitive map in, in the classical definition that I just described. Um, but there are problems with this definition. Um, so first of all, if, um, this uh, path integration is a very useful strategy if you're a bird or a fish or a desert ant, where you have these wide open spaces that you're trying to traverse. Um, but for many uh, mammalian species that have to navigate confined spaces, it's less useful, right? Because if I wanted to plot a shortest path back to my office, I'd have to blast through all these walls, um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't really make sense to, or it wouldn't be particularly useful to encode Euclidean distance between my current location and my office, let's say. Um, so obstacles pr prevent, uh, present a, an obstacle for the usefulness of path integration. Um, uh, now, there's, there's many other issues. So for example, what about multiple goals? What if I don't want to just go from point A to point B, but I actually want to plan some trajectory that's going to maximize my cumulative reward? What if the different reward locations have different reward magnitudes, or there's uncertainty about where I am or where the rewards are? Or there's action costs, like I might have to travel up a hill or, or remove some obstacle and so on. Right? 
So path integration is solving a very restricted problem, uh, which it that does not correspond to the more general problem that most animals face in navigating the world and in general making decisions. So um, I want to take a step back and think about the, how you would construct a cognitive map from first principles if you're starting from the perspective of designing an agent that actually uh, acted in the world. So this is really the problem that is solved by reinforcement learning. Now, I want to just um, nip one misconception in the bud right away, which is uh, when people hear the term reinforcement learning, they often are thinking about particular algorithms, something kind of like, you know, you get rewarded it and you're going to do that, do whatever you did again. Um, but I'm referring to reinforcement learning as a problem specification for which there are many different algorithms to solve that problem, and I'll describe a few of them. Uh, so the problem, uh, the reinforcement learning problem, is maximization of cumulative reward, or sometimes discounted cumulative reward. Um, and path integration is not a general solution to this problem. Um, it, and I'll, I'll just give you a, a little bit more of formalism here to, to situate you. Um, so we're imagining an agent that can take actions to influence the environment. Um, uh, and in particular, the environment will give feedback to the agent based on its, uh, the actions the agent took in the form of rewards and state transitions. So at any point in time, the, the agent occupies a state. Um, and can transition between states based on its actions. Um, now, this problem in general, if there are no constraints, is basically intractable because how do you maximize or even estimate the value function um, over some infinite horizon uh, without it, uh, uh, placing any constraints on the structure of the environment? Um, so typically, the, the move made in reinforcement learning is to assume that the environment corresponds to a markup decision process, which means that the, the transition, the, the state transitions and rewards generated by the environment only depend on the agent's current state of action. Okay? So it's memoryless, conditional on current state and action. Uh, and that simplifies things, and in particular, it allows you to write the value function in a recursive form known as the Bellman equation, and that's basically the core of all efficient reinforcement learning algorithms. Right. So let's imagine. You're the sprat, you're trying to maximize your cumulative reward intake, and I've labeled three different states here which correspond to spatial locations, but it's important to keep in mind that states don't necessarily have to correspond to spatial locations. Um, they can be abstract. In fact, the, the formal definition of a state is that information about the environment such that the environment satisfies the markup property, so that it satisfies this conditional independence structure. Um, Okay, but taking space as the representation of state for now, um, how should we think about the animal, uh, how, how should we, uh, um, what sort of algorithms could the animal use to solve this cumulative reward maximization problem? And I'll distinguish between two broad families of algorithms. So um, one approach here um, that's typically called model-free is to build a big lookup table that tells you for each state and each action uh, how much cumulative reward you hope to obtain for taking that, that particular action in that particular state. Um, and it turns out that you can update this lookup table um, through error-driven learning just by interacting with the environment without knowing the actual structure of the environment. Okay? Um, and this is, this is the idea of temporal difference learning, the, the most well-known model-free reinforcement learning algorithm, which exploits um, the Bellman equation, so it, it exploits the fact that the value function can be defined in this recursive Form. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now. But suffice it to say that you can use local learning rules to update the elements of this lookup table. Um, and one reason that people in neuroscience are particularly interested in uh, model-free reinforcement learning and the temporal difference learning idea in particular uh, is that the learning signal that you need to update the elements of this lookup table, this prediction error signal, um, seems to be reported by the phasic firing of dopamine. So you see dopamine neurons that burst um, in response to unexpected reward and pause in response to uh, omission of expected reward. And when reward is fully expected, you don't see basic firing of dopamine. So those are some of the key signatures that led people to think that dopamine neurons are uh, reporting this reward prediction. But the dopamine stuff is not important for the purposes of this talk. It's just to motivate why we're interested in this problem. Um, a very different kind of approach to solving the reinforcement learning problem uh, is known as a, a model-based uh, algorithm. So it's a family of algorithms, model-based algorithms. And the basic idea here is that the animal is going to learn a model of the environment 
And the model, in a market decision process, the model is completely specified by the Markovian state transition function. Um, so it tells you which state you're going to go to or with what probability, depending on your current state of action. And then your reward function. So what is your expected reward in each state? Uh, expected immediate reward. Okay? And if you have those two pieces of information, then there are various algorithms for using that information to compute a value function. So for example, uh, you can, because of this, um, because of the Bellman equation, you can, you can use dynamic programming to compute the value function, um, or you can do tree searches. So you can, you can start from your current state and imagine forward, uh, use the model to simulate forward and, and think about what would happen conditional on a particular action. Um, now, Independent of the particular details of model-based and model-free algorithms, these have complementary operating characteristics. Um, so the model-free approach is computationally efficient in the sense that if I want to know what action to take, all I have to do is inspect my lookup table. Um, and even in more complex situations where you might uh, not have a lookup table but some kind of function approximator, all I have to do is use my uh, function approximator, and that's typically fairly efficient. Um, but the problem is that it's inflexible. And the reason is that if you think about this lookup table, right, um, because of the recursive structure of the value function, every time um, there's some change in the world, like if I introduce some, some obstacle here or I change the reward here, um, I would have to relearn a large part of the lookup table, if not the whole lookup table. Um, and that, so, so it's very um, uh, inflexible in, in, that, in the statistical sense that you need a lot of data uh, uh, you would need a lot of experience in the environment every time the environment changed. Um, you can contrast that with the model-based uh, solution where if you change the environment, that corresponds to a local change in the model. Like if I, if I change the reward, then I can just update that one element of my reward function. If I introduce a barrier, I can just update that one part of my transition function. And then um, I just have to rerun whatever value computation algorithm I have. Like you know, tree search or dynamic programming to get the new value function. So um, it's very flexible um, in that statistical sense that I don't need to experience the whole environment again, but it's very inefficient, right? Because I have to run this algorithm, this expensive algorithm every time I want to get a value. Okay? Um, and it turns out that actually both systems seem to be oper operative in the brain. Um, I'll just give you a, a really quick overview of why, that seems to, why we think that's the case. So the classic experiments on this were done by Tony Dickinson in the 1980s, and, and I'll caricature the following experiment. So you, you put a rat in front of a lever, it can press the lever for food, um, and you do that for a while. Then you take the lever away and you give the, the animal food freely, uh, but you devalue the food. For example, you pair it with illness, or you selectively satiate the animal on that food so it doesn't want the food anymore, it will not consume that food anymore. Um, now remember, this is all happening in the absence of the lever. So now you put the animal back in front of the lever, and the question is, will the animal press the lever? Um, and model-free and model-based approaches make different predictions for this situation. So um, the model-free approach is basically a fancy version of Thorndike's law of effect, which says that if you took an action and you got rewarded for it, you're going to be more likely to take that action in the future. Now from the model-free perspective, the animal has always been rewarded for pressing the lever. So the law of effect says that it should continue pressing the lever, even though that's going to lead to obtaining food that it doesn't actually want to consume. Um, the model-based uh, approach makes the opposite prediction. So it has an actual causal model of the environment. It knows that if it presses the lever, it will get the food. And if it eats the food, it will get sick. And, and with that causal model, it knows that it should not press the lever to obtain this devalued food. And it turns out that you can see both of these patterns of behavior, pressing lever or not pressing lever, depending on a number of factors. So for example, uh, how much you train the animal in that first phase. So if you overtrain the animal, it's like it's formed a habit, and it's more reliant on the model three uh, system. Um, and, it will, and it will continue pressing the lever to obtain food that it doesn't actually want. Um, and the reason why we think it's a, these are distinct systems is because they can actually be neurally dissociated. So you can um, selectively lesion one system. Um, for example, lesioning uh, the dorsolateral stratum seems to knock out this model three system, uh, whereas lesioning the dorsomedial system, uh, dorsomedial stratum will knock out the model based system. And there's an analogous distinction um, in the prefrontal cortex. Um, 
So I won't go into that, but suffice it to say, the point here is that we have a fairly well-established dual systems architecture for thinking about how the frame solves reinforcement learning problems. Um, now you could start from this, uh, with this starting point in mind, you could say, well, maybe the cognitive map corresponds to model-based RL, and people have suggested this. Um, so maybe the cognitive map is something like the transition function, um, and then we could navigate using model-based reinforcement learning. Um, now that's possible, but I'm going to actually suggest a different possibility, uh, which doesn't actually fit neatly into the two categories of model-based and model-free reinforcement learning, which is that the cognitive map corresponds to a kind of predictive code. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'm going to, uh, the, well, the, the basic high-level idea here is that the cognitive map is encoding predictive statistics, uh, a kind of compressed predictive representation of upcoming states. Um, and I'm going to appeal to a particular formalism that was developed by Peter Dayan several decades ago, um, known as the successor representation. And the, the real value of the successor representation, uh, from a computational point of view, is that it renders value computation a linear operation. So that means that value computation using the successor representation is really efficient. It's a compar comparable order of efficiency to um, model-free reinforced learning. But at the same time, it has some of the appealing flexibility of a model-based system. So it's somehow, it's in, in some sense, it sits in between the flexibility and efficiency of these uh, different systems. But, but does that effectively yeah. mean that you have to update it much more frequently because it's a successor based representation which is not going to be valid for too long in the future? Um, it depends what you mean by updating more. So if I have time, I'll discuss some experiments with humans that, uh, that illustrate a, a particular vulnerability of the successor representation um, that dis distinguishes it from uh, model-based and learning. So, so actually, the, the Dickinson kind of experiments, those devaluation experiments that I showed you, where you change the reward, the successor representation, um, without any um, new updating, can accommodate those findings. Because what happens is that, actually, this will be clear when I when I describe the actual map. Um, let me let me first just give you a, an intuition for what what the successor representation looks like, and compare it to a Euclidean cognitive map. So, uh, let's imagine that we have. Uh, a representation of this maze uh, using a collection of location tuned neurons. Uh, so I'm, I'm indexing them by their preferred location. Um, so in this maze, if the, if the tuning functions, the spatial tuning function of these neurons are sensitive to um, Euclidean distances, then um, if, you look, if you look at the firing rate of this neuron that's tuned to location one, when the animal visits location three, um, it's going to be firing more in location three compared to location two because these are close in Euclidean distance compared to, to one and two. Um, so it looks something like this. Um, but it ignores the fact that, there's act that, that the geodesic connecting one and, and three is actually much longer compared to two. Um, and intuitively, it, for the purposes of navigation, you'd want your spatial representation to encode the, the geodesic distances, because that's what really matters for, for travel. Um, so the idea of a predictive code is that these the, the, the underlying um, tuning functions for these neurons will be sensitive to the geometry of the environment. So that it will properly encode that 2 is closer to 1 than 3 is closer to 1. So how are we going to do that? Um, so here's the formal definition of the successor representation. We can think about it as a matrix, uh, if we have a discrete state space, where the rows correspond to some initial state. It's the state in which you initiate some um, journey through the environment. Um, so you, we can imagine a trajectory where we start some initial state, we follow our policy, and we, nav and, and we uh, traverse the environment uh, for some arbitrary length of time. And um, as we're moving through the environment, I'm going to uh, keep track of how often I visit each other state. Okay? Um, so that's what this, this identity function here is. So it's a, it's a counter of how, uh, of how often I'm, I'm visiting each state, but I have this discount term here that's downweighting states that are uh, visited far in the future. So I'm going to care more about states that I visit near in the future than far in the future. I'm going to discount that exponentially. So. The, the, the formal definition of the successor representation is the expected discounted future occupancy of a particular state S prime conditional on starting in, in state S. Is that clear to everybody? Is it indicator function? Yes. 
Yeah. You said I didn't. Oh, sorry. I'm an indicator. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So why is this useful? So it turns out that if your environment adheres to the Markov assumption, then you can write down the value, so that's the expected discounted future reward, as the inner product between the successor representation and the immediate reward. So, so this R is a vector that tells you how much expected reward, immediate reward you're going to get in each in each state. So it's intuitive that if I want to know how good is this particular state that I'm in now, I ask um, how often am I going to visit all these all the other states and how much reward am I going to get in each of these other states. And if I add all those things up, that corresponds to how good my current state is. Clear? Okay. Um, okay. So, so, as I said before, this is really convenient if you have this M matrix, because now every time I want to know the value of a state, I can just take this inner product. And as, assuming my state space is not too big, that should be practical. Um, it turns out that also, the successor representation obeys a Bellman equation. So, that means that I can express the successor representation for a current state recursively as a function of the... the, the, the a future state. So, so in particular, um, if we use x as a vector that, that represents which state I'm in now, um, then I can represent the um, successor representation. This is one row of the successor representation, but the, the row corresponding to state s, um, my current state, as a, as a function of um, uh, my immediate state occupancy and future state occupancy. And the reason this is useful Quite analogously to how we, we can derive um, temporal difference learning algorithms from the Bellman equation applied to the value function, we can do the same thing for the successor representation. So I can write, I can describe an error-driven learning rule which looks basically the same as the error-driven learning rule for value, but now I apply it to to states or to state occupancies. Um, and if you have instead of this tabular representation where each state is, um, we have a value function. Um, a lookup table for each state, I can, I have instead a feature vector, and I represent the value function as some linear combination of those features, then the same idea applies, but now I, I'm, I'm representing the successor representation in feature space, so I can keep track of feature occupancies rather than state occupancies. So it's the same basic idea. All right, so with that, that formal background, I want to come to thinking about place cells and grid cells. Um, and I, I want to make the kind of um, uh, uh, heretical assertion that place cells aren't really place cells at all, um, but rather something like a re retrodictive code um, as, as instantiated in the successor representation. So what I mean by that is, um, so if we for now think about states as indexing space, and I take one column of the successor representation, um, so these are, so this is saying, given that I've transitioned to this particular state, what are the other states that I likely have visited in the recent past? Um, I, I'd like to claim that this column corresponds to a place field. Um, and in, if you think about this for in, uh, what the successor representation looks like uh, in an open field, you'll see that it will tend to be radially symmetric um, with a, a width that's determined by this discount function, so how, how much you care about um, state, um, state occupancies in the future. Um, and, uh, but more interesting things happen when you have interesting geometry, which I'll get into in a moment. Um, but the point here is that a place field corresponds to a column of the successor representation, so it's a kind of retrodictive code. And then the successor representation for your current state is represented as a population code across the cells. Yeah. Um, even in open field, if we take this view, wouldn't you predict that the place field width would change depending on task? Yes, that's right. I, I, How does that happen? Well, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, phenomena like reward clustering, which are relevant to this. Yeah. Um, and actually, a linear track. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some relevant data from linear track. Was there another question? Yeah. Why is it a, could it also be a row? Why is it a column and not a row? Um, that, so... <clears throat> well, so so I we, we basically you could you could define it in that way, right? Um, but we we basically in in comparing the model to that to the data that I'm going to talk about, it seemed to make more sense to think about it as like a column. Kind of row. Yeah. You mentioned before that about uh, representing this in the feature space. Yes. So there's no feature space here; it's all tabular. But, but some of the other stuff we've done. Because in that time, we 
to mapping for the rewards would be more complex. Sorry? If you want to map the rewards into value. Yeah. Uh, I guess you need to make the feature space to be orthogonal. Uh, Why do you need to be orthogonal? Otherwise, you can't just have multiply a successful, a successful organization to uh, reward. So we will have to be also represented in the feature space. Yeah, so, so for now, for the yeah. purposes of this presentation, let's just well, think about okay. it as tabular, right? Because we won't get into the complexities of what happens when you have a feature space. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's not that much more complicated, but it, but it is okay. uh, a little bit more complicated. Okay. Yeah. So I'm imagining that I have a successor representation for each tabular state, so I've basically divided this, 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 this um, space into some, for, and if we're talking about spaces that look like this, we can think about it as just a grid. Uh, and then we also have an immediate reward function. Um, okay, so suffice it to say that if you just um, build the successor representation in uh, open field, you'll get things that look roughly like classical place fields. Um, but let's talk about some more diagnostic data. Um, I want to call your attention to this experiment that was done um, by Matt Wilson's lab, uh, Meta et al. in 1997, where they had a rat running along a linear track, and with repeated traversals of this linear track in the same direction, they found that place cells started to skew in the direction opposite of travel. Um, and I think this comes back to, to Talia's question, which is that uh, if you have this retrodictive code, then it makes sense because now the states that preceded a particular location on that track are going to become progressively more predictive of that of that future location, and you'll see you'll see in this directional bias emerge in the successor representation. And, I, and it, it's important to keep in mind this is this seems to be inconsistent with the classical definition of a place field that's purely encoding spatial location. Uh, another phenomenon that, that's relevant here is reward clustering. Uh, and I, I neglected to mention one important aspect of the successor representation, which is that it's policy dependent, right? So it's computing the expectation of these op state occupancies under your current policy. Um, so even though it's not explicitly encoding things like reward, reward is going to change your policy, and that policy is going to change the successor representation, because you're going to be visiting different states, so you'll encode different feature occupancies. Um, and, and so um, when, when you selectively place reward in a particular location of a space, um, so in this case it was a circular track, you observe clustering of place fields around that rewarded location, which is consistent with our prediction that, that, that uh, because the animal is going to visit that location in space more often, there's, there's going to be a preponderance of the representation in the success representation. It's going to be kind of prioritized. Um, another relevant... Uh, source of data here are constraints by barriers. So uh, remember I was saying how the geodesic distance really matters for the successor representation. Um, and indeed, if you, if you plot it in, in, room, in environments where there are barriers, like rooms, you'll see that it will deform around the, around the barriers. And that has also been observed, that kind of deformation has been observed experimentally. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that those deformations are, are relatively local. Um, so this is uh, an experiment from Pousset's lab where they had this Tolman detour maze. So this, the, I, the, the idea here is that you block some particular path and the animal now, with basically with very little uh, to no retraining, will find a detour. Um, and they were interested in what happens to the place fields when the barrier is introduced. And what they found was that there was deformation of the place fields but, uh, uh, around the barrier, but select uh, but it was selective for around, near the barrier. So place fields that were far away from the barrier did not get affected very much. Um, and that's consistent with uh, our theoretical proposal here that you're going to, that the place, the success representation is going to tend to deform around, deform locally around barriers, and you're not necessarily going to get a global deformation. Um, the, now, I've been talking about space, but um, I emphasized at the beginning that this is not really about space per se. You can have non-spatial state spaces that matter. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about some of the applications this idea to other experiments which have mostly been done in humans. So this um, study from Christian Doller's lab had this pretty cool virtual environment with these teleporters, so that it allowed you to dissociate space and time. So you, you basically get into this teleporter and be transported to some other location in this uh, virtual environment. Um, and what they found by analyzing the multivariate patterns in the hippocampus is that the hippocampus cares not just about spatial distance, but also about um, temporal 
And that's consistent with our, our model in the sense that um, the, the, the occupancy is going to be sensitive to both space and time. Um, and a, another, another relevant data point comes from work by Anna Shapiro, where she had people following a random walk on this, um, this uh, state space that had cliques. And each of these states is represented by a visual symbol. So there's no spa really spatial element to this task at all. Um, but if you look in the hippocampus, you'll see that the similarity structure, the multivariate similarity structure um, of these different states reflects the underlying clustering of the state space so that these states seem to have more similar hippocampal representations compared to uh, um, the, the similarity between states within each cluster was greater than the similarity between clusters. And this is a multidimensional scaling plot that show that. Um, and you see the same thing in the successor representation because of course, when you're in one of these states, you're more likely to visit uh, other states within the same cluster compared to states outside of that cluster. Um, yeah, I'll just here I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, so I'll just I'll talk a little bit about interrhinal uh, grid cells. So you, we've already seen a number of different explanations for how grid cells arise. What are they encoding? Um, you know, one of some of the original ideas were, were that it encoded something like a Fourier basis for, for place cells. Um, I'm going to offer a different account, and, and I should say this with the caveat that I readily admit that this is not going to explain all features of grid cells like the, the ones that Billy was discussing. Um, but it, it's at least a kind of, um, uh, it, 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 it's a focal point for thinking about what grid cells might mean in the context of a predictive representation of the state space. So in particular, I'm going to suggest that grid cells encode something like, uh, encode the eigen decomposition of the successor representation. Um, and in an open field, you'll, you will get uh, lattice-like representations. Um, and in fact, you can sort those, um, those eigenvectors based on their eigenvalue, and you can get um, different spatial frequencies um, that, that look somewhat like what you'd, what you'd see in the dorsal ventral axis of the neuronal cortex. Um, you also see some other weird things, um, like stretchy um, cells that are aligned to different axes of the environment, um, cells that seem to, def um, grid, grid fields that seem to deform around um, barriers. I actually, I, I asked Mariana Finn about this recently, whether she ever saw funky grid fields like this, and she said, sure, but we threw them away. We didn't know what to do with them, which of course is, you know, that's the story of neurophysiology right there. But um, the, uh, so, so maybe we'll go and, and reanalyze her data. Um, but, but the point here is that the eigenvectors, unlike the Fourier bases, are going to be sensitive to these kinds of um, uh, the, the underlying geometric structure of the environment. Uh, and there is some evidence for this, um, for example, these studies by Derek Min, where you see this repeating structure across different segments of a, of a, a spatially fractured environment. So the animals had to uh, do these, uh, navigate these hairpin mazes. And you see, you see these grid fields that seem to have repetitive structure um, in the different columns of, the, uh, of this hairpin maze. And you can see something similar when you look at the eigenvectors uh, of the success representation. Now, you don't necessarily have to com actually compute the eigen decomposition from the successor representation. Um, in fact, you can derive uh, uh, stochastic approximation algorithms that directly estimate the, the eigenvectors from state transitions. So, you, so, and that's important because there, there's some. Um, we shouldn't assume that grid cells either are derived from place fields or the other way around. Um, so first of all, we, there, there's substantial evidence that grid cells are not generating place cells. For example, grid cells seem to develop after place cells, um, and removing interrhinal input to hippocampus is not completely eliminating place cells. Um, so I want to suggest a different possibility, which is that the grid cells are acting like a kind of regularization network. Um, so the idea here is that I can if I use the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, um, I can reconstruct the uh, success representation, but it will be a smoother version of the success representation depending on how many eigenvalues, I, uh, how many eigenvectors I'm using. Um, and the reason that this might be useful is because 
Place cells are very sensitive to uh, noisy sensory input. Um, and for example, if you turn off the lights, they may be briefly stable, but over time they're going to degrade. Whereas grid cells seem to be primarily driven by self-motion cues. And so they're, they're, more, um, they're, they're more stable, less sensitive to these kinds of um, to, to noise and sensory input. And so that might uh, be a reason why you could use grid cells um, at, to construct a regularized version of the successor representation and in effect smooth the successor representation as it's being updated using these error-driven learning rules. Uh, now this is completely speculative, but it, it's broadly consistent with a few findings. So for example, um, if you lesion the internal cortex, even though you don't completely get rid of place cells, um, you do uh, disrupt them in certain ways. So for example, they become less stable, um, uh, they have reduction in discharge rate and field size. Um, and as I already mentioned, I think that the, um, grid cells are, uh, in terms of their inputs, are well positioned to uh, serve this function. But this is still lacking direct experimental evidence. Um, I will, um, let's see, I'll through, okay. Um, another speculation about why these eigenvectors are useful is because they, they can be used to discover a hierarchical spatial structure that, um, that could be useful for hierarchical reinforcement learning. So, so if I want to make plans at multiple levels of abstraction, like I want to think about how to get back to my office, or probably right now how to get to the lecture hall, um, I don't think about that kind of um, planning problem at the level of my um, effectors. I think about it at a more, at least initially, at a, at a higher level of abstraction, how to get out of this room, out of this building, and so on. Um, uh, and, a, and a basic uh, fundamental problem in the reinforced learning literature is how do you discover that hierarchical structure? So there are many algorithms for using that hierarchical structure, um, but it's still uh, an open question, what's the best way to extract that hierarchical structure from experience? Um, and we can utilize this idea of the eigen decomposition of the successor representation to address this. Um, and it's closely related to work in computer vision known as normalized cuts. And the idea is that I can get a hierarchical decomposition of space by looking at the second large, the, the eigenvector with the second largest eigenvalue, um, which will have discontinuities at boundary, uh, at um, bottlenecks in the state space. So like if I have two different rooms, um, the, the largest decomposition of the rooms will, will show this discontinuity. If I segment the eigenvector at that discontinuity, um, then I can, I can split the environment into these two pieces. And then I can actually do this recursively. So I can take each of these pieces and, and look at the eye and, and um, do another segmentation and find um, this finer grained segmentation of, of the state space. Um, and that will provide me with the representational infrastructure to do things like hierarchical reinforcement learning, where I can plan at uh, coarser uh, spatial scales, for example. Um, and it's been demonstrated that this is very useful for actual and there's some evidence, at least from humans, that humans actually do something like this. Um, so since I have a little bit of time, I'll just give you a, a taste of the, the experiments that we've done in humans to study this. Um, so as I already mentioned, the successor representation actually can explain a lot of the same phenomena that model-based algorithms were originally invoked to explain in the animal and human reinforcement learning literature. In particular, when you devalue a reward, um, successor representation will be sensitive to the devaluation um, because what, in effect what's happening is you're just modifying the reward function and leaving the transition structure intact. Uh, so you don't have to update the successor representation and, it will, and when you compute the value function by taking the inner product between that successor representation matrix and this updated reward function, it will immediately reflect changes in the reward contingencies. Um, and and the, one way to think about this is that the successor representation is a compressed representation of the transition structure, but it leaves the reward function uncompressed. Whereas the value function in a model-free uh, algorithm is compressing both of those things into a cache value function. In other words, the model-free approach gets rid of all the fine-grained details about immediate reward and transition structure and caches everything into these value functions. Uh, and hence, it will be completely inflexible to any changes in the, in the reward transition function. Whereas the successor representation is a kind of partially compressed representation. It compresses the transition structure, but not the reward structure. And the model-based approach is completely uncompressed. It learns the transition, 
transition and reward structures, then it always has available uh, that representation format. So, yeah. So what do you mean by, by so you're saying that what the, the successor representation is a compression of the transition uh, statistics or transition matrix? Yeah. Or, or why is it isn't? Because you cannot recover. You can so. So, so I can recover the transi there. transitions. No, I can recover m from t, right? Yeah. So you so you can. Um, you can compute the successor representation from the transition matrix, right? But you can't go in the opposite direction. You can't you can't recover the transition structure, the fine-grained transition structure from the successor representation. There are many different transition okay. matrices that would give rise to the same successor representation. Um, the inverse is not unique. Pardon? Because the inverse is not unique. What? But why can we uh, recover t from m just by inverting, just by doing the algebra? Um, because it, it's because it's ill posed. There's, there are different transition functions that will map to the same M matrix. It's mathematic, yeah. it's because the inverse yeah. of M is not unique. Yeah. Just by manipulating this equation, T is equal to right, M inverse. Yeah. Identity yeah. minus M inverse divided by gamma. Yeah. But that's not unique because I guess the inverse of M is not unique. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Um, so we can think about the SR, the success representation is com compiling or compressing the transition function. And that makes a particular prediction, which is that um, if I, instead of changing the reward function, which is what the classical devaluation experiments did, I instead change the transition function, um, then the successor representation will be vulnerable to that manipulation in the sense that it will be relatively insensitive to changes in the transition structure. More generally, successor representation will be more sensitive to reward structure changes than transition structure changes. And that asymmetry is not true of model-free or model-based algorithms. So model-free algorithms, because they're maximally compressed, will be equally insensitive to both transition and reward changes. And the model-based approaches, since they're maximally uncompressed, will be equally sensitive to both changes. But So neither one predicts this asymmetry in sensitivity. And that's what, that's what we set out to test in a very simple design. So this is with humans, where um, we first train them to, to um, traverse in this ballistic way, so they don't actually have control over the state transitions here. Um, these two paths, these, uh, these two parallel chains uh, through state space, and they learn in this first phase, which is common across both of these conditions, that um, state one leads to a lot of reward, and state two leads to very little reward. Okay. So if you ask them, do you want to start in state one or state two, they definitely want to start in state one. Okay. Um, now in the second phase, we start them off in the intermediate state, right? so they don't get to go back and revisit the first states. Um, and we do one of two different changes depending on which condition it is. So um, in reward evaluation, we just swap the rewards for these states. Um, whereas in transition evaluation, um, we swap the transition structure. Okay. And both of these manipulations should have theoretically equivalent changes on the value function at the first stage, right? So, so when we then ask them, do you want to start in state one or state two, in both cases, if they're doing everything optimally, they should prefer to start in state two rather than state one. Okay. Where, now, so that's what the model-based <coughs> algorithm would predict. You would predict that, um, that, you would, that across both conditions, um, subjects would always want to switch their preferences to state two. Uh, yeah. Just how do you instantiate the phase two difference in what the participants are actually doing? So they, so this is, a, I didn't describe the cover story. So they, they're doing this kind of career task where they have to deliver packages to different um, locations. Um, so they don't actually have, they're basically being driven around the state space and they don't have control over what, where they go. Um, and they, they, they just have to basically press a button. This is just to keep them paying attention when they get to the reward location. So, so, they, so this is this is all out, out of the participants. But they're able to notice how they are arriving at. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's right. And we and we do, we have some checks to make sure that they're actually learning the new uh, reward structure or transition structure. Here. Um, now, a model-free algorithm would predict that subjects should be equally insensitive to both of these cases because the model-free algorithm requires you to experience the full chain of states and rewards in order to, to apply these um, the reinforcement learning updates. Um, and we basically deprived 
subjects of being able to use that algorithm explicitly because we never put them back in the first state. Um, but the successor representation predicts that um, when you just change the rewards, that will immediately propagate to the, for, to the value function of these states because the successor representation has this um, uh, factorization into um, the, the successor representation reward function. Um, but that's not true of the transition devaluation treatment where um, now the, the, t for the transition, for, sorry, for the successor representation to reflect this change, it would have to actually update its successor representation for these first stage states. And, it, and for the same reason that the, the a temporal difference learning algorithm can't update the value, the cache values for the first stage state, the same is true for the successor representation. It can't update the cache values for the first stage state. So it predicts this uh, asymmetry here between transition and reward devaluation. And I'll just skip ahead here and show you that that, that that is indeed the case, that although they're not completely insensitive to transition uh, devaluation, they are um, more sensitive to reward than transition devaluation. So I think, yes, I'm going to just stop there, and I'll thank my collaborators on this. Um, and then thank you for listening. Assuming if there's a way to write down exactly the eigenvectors for this environment, for example, and, and is it really hard to get the grid cells to be exactly hexagonal? Yeah, so you, you need, you, you, they're not going to be exactly hexagonal in the environments that, like if, if, with these, these boundary conditions that I showed you, but we can define other boundary conditions where you will get the hexagonal grids. You might have already um, answered that with a human work. Uh, I'm not sure, but could you think of a, like an experiment, let's say in rodents, where you have um, the set, like two setups, the same exact setups, the same exact geometry, and the same rewards, but you kind of train the animals to have a different policy, mm -hmm. and then see whether the representation, the successor representation, yeah, uh, yeah. changes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great. So just actually, we have another human experiment where we explore this policy dependence idea. Um, and I, I didn't have time to talk about that. But yeah, yeah that, that's a good idea. Yeah. Does the model make predictions about the relative number of gray cells and red cells? So we... What uh, is the eigenvector of the other representation maybe there should be more that's, Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I don't think, I mean, not in the way that we've thought about it, because we just stipulate that, you know, however we've, we've segmented the state space, there's going to be cells tuned to, to particular states. Um, so we're basically agnostic about that, because you could have redundant coding. You have multiple cells corresponding to a single state, and that doesn't exclude where that's possible. All right, I have to run to go teach, unfortunately. So thank you again.